welcome. I was born on the 30th of April, 1651. The Institute did not exist then. We lived in a little town called Reims, about three days' walk northeast of Paris. I, John Baptist de La Salle, was born and baptized a Catholic all the very same day. Reims is small, but it is known throughout all of France. It is the birthplace of many saints and great men, but the major glory is every single French king, including Louis XIV, has been crowned here in our church, the Metropolitan Cathedral of Reims. Although Reims is an industrial town, it has wide promenades and beautiful public decorations throughout. Grand ornate iron gates welcome all visitors into our town, and once you pass through those gates, you are greeted with mountains of colors and textures. Merchants from the town's weaving factories parade the streets selling their wares, a great place to live. Fascinating for a young boy. My family's lived here a long time, since the 13th century. My father, Monsieur Louis de La Salle, was a magistrate at the Presidio Court of Reims. My mother, born Nicole Moet, was the daughter of Monsieur Jean Moet de Brie and his wife, Madame Perrette L'Espagnol, members of the royal class. But mother lost all claim to royalty when she married my father, a member of a lower class, a member of the bourgeoisie, but still considered a commoner. Mother married young, 17 years of age, and altogether had 11 children in 20 years of marriage. I'm sad to report that four of my siblings died in infancy, but two girls and four boys survived. Make that five boys. I also lived, <laughs> and all seven of us lived good, productive lives. Four of us dedicated ourselves to the service of our Lord. One sister became a nun and entered the convent at saint Etienne les dames One brother joined the monks of saint jean Vieve, and eventually became prior of that monastery and two of us became priests, and both of us eventually served as canons at the illustrious cathedral in Rheims. We had the good fortune to be born during what the French call Le Grand Siècle, the Great Century. King Louis XIV ascended the throne in 1651, the same year I was born, and reigned for 64 years until 1715. I've already outlived him by four years, but I'm getting ahead of myself. My family lived here on Rue de l'Arbalète in a house called the Le Cloche Mansion. There's a rear view of the courtyard, and here's a front view. I loved it here. When I looked out my window, if I leaned far enough and just right, I could see the flying buttresses supporting the cathedral. <laughs> My grandfather Moet was a local senior and had his own special bench in the chapel. I loved to go with him and sit and watch and listen to the services. Grandfather taught me how to follow the very complicated rubrics of the breviary. I even learned to say the whole thing by myself by the age of five. I was fascinated with everything religious. I'd go to church, memorize the different services, and then run home to my room and play church in my room for the rest of the day. <laughs> I couldn't get enough of it. My parents knew this, and church became my reward for being good. It was the celebration of Holy Mass that fascinated me most. I longed not to be a mere spectator. As soon as I was allowed, I took the required lessons and became an altar boy. My elementary education began at home with private tutors, learning to read, write, and spell from Latin texts, as well as learning the manners and the social etiquette of the day. The firstborn male child is usually directed towards the military, but I would have none of it, and it was decided my younger brother would go in my place. When I was only 11, I took my first formal steps towards the priesthood by receiving the clerical tonsure. The ceremony consisted of the ritual clipping of hair from the crown of the head in the style of the ancient monks. I also got to wear the black ecclesiastical cassock. From that moment on, everyone knew I was marked as a future priest. 
soon after, my uncle, who had been a canon at the cathedral in Reim for over 50 years, decided to retire and declared that I should inherit his post. At the grand age of 15, I was a member of the church senate and one of the principal advisors of the bishop. <laughs> now, normally this job is full time with lots of responsibilities, but exceptions were made for young boys still in school. I started my studies for the priesthood at the local school in Reim, and then transferred to the seminary at saint saul Peace in Paris and studied theology at the Sorbonne. But after only a year and a half, I had to return home as both my parents passed away. They died within months of each other. Being the eldest, I was now the head of the family. I longed to return to the seminary in Paris, but my new responsibilities kept me at home. However, I managed to receive my degrees from the School of Theology in Reim in early spring, 1678. On Holy Saturday of the same year, at the age of 27, I was ordained a priest. The next day, Easter Sunday, I celebrated my first Mass before a small gathering of relatives and friends in the small side chapel where I used to sit as a boy. And from that moment on, the celebration of Holy Mass became the focal point of all my devotion, and I resolved to celebrate it every day for the rest of my life. I became consumed with a longing to show God my gratitude. However, had I known then what I know now, I would have seen God's hand shaping the course of my life. <laughs> and sure enough, one day, I was just saying Mass for the Sisters of the Child Jesus in their new convent, which I had helped establish, and was feeling reluctant to leave. When the Mother Superior approached me to introduce a Monsieur Adrien Niel from Rouen. There, he had run a successful charity school for poor boys and been asked to come here to Reims to start another one. Well, modeled on his schools, the Sisters of the Child Jesus had done so much for the education of our poor girls, why couldn't the same thing be done for our poor boys? How many times did I walk past them in the streets muttering what a nuisance they were? I never saw the child crying for help. The child orphaned by his parents who were working long, hard 12-hour days in the fields and factories. The child left on his own to survive as best he could. I saw only dirty little beggars roaming the city, fighting, gambling, stealing and robbing, and generally terrorizing the streets. It was Niel who opened my eyes to their cycle of poverty. Well, most of these boys would never attend school their entire lives. Those lucky few whose parents could afford to send them only went for a couple of years. By the age of eight, eight, they were reclaimed to work the fields and factories to help the family survive. <laughs> Without learning to read or write, they could never break this cycle to better themselves, to improve their family life, or contribute to the good of society. It was Niel who was opening my eyes, showing me how we could lead them from darkness to light. Whereas I was calm and tried to do nothing without great reflection, Niel was energetic, enterprising, and a great enthusiast. Some say his act of zeal was just what was needed. One was for the other. The stimulus needed to bring God's work into being. Monsieur Niel, although your intentions are good, it is not a good idea to go directly to the city council to try to garner support for your project at this time. There are already too many charities clamoring for our city's resources, and it'll be no easy matter to win the approval of the archbishop. <laughs> no doubt the poor of our city need your new foundation, but the interest of God and the poor must often take second place to politics. I decided to call in a local group of priests and pastors to form a small council to help us and give advice. Something has to be done. They are running wild through the streets and alleys of the worst neighborhoods. You know the city officials will veto such a proposal. And so will the masters of the little schools if they have anything to say in the matter. And the writing masters. It will never get off the ground. Once they find out, they will present too much opposition. You are all right. So the only way to get this school off the ground 
is to safeguard it from all opposition. We must place it under the protection of someone not only generous enough to support it, but someone zealous enough to assume responsibility and someone discreet enough to avoid publicity. What would It will be too difficult. And impossible to keep quiet from the public officials. Father, what were you going to say? What would happen if we started a school to teach the catechism, as well as learning to read or write? We could then place it under the protection of a pastor. Interesting idea. Yes, that might work. A pastor does have the right to provide for a religious instruction of his parishioners. Yes, and his position as pastor authorizes him to appoint teachers to instruct them in Christian doctrine. No one will venture to interfere with him or with a Christian school. But who should be this person? After much discussion and searching, we found this person in Father Nicholas Dornier, the pastor of San Maurice. And in April 1679, we opened the first free Catholic school for the education of poor boys of the city of Reims. It was located in Father Dornier's parish in a small building off the side entrance of his church. Monsieur Niel hired two schoolmasters, and Father Dornier, as promised, housed both of them in his parish. Along with Monsieur Niel, and a young assistant. <laughs> Everything had turned out better than I had anticipated. There remained nothing more for me to do uh, but to thank God, resume my studies, and full-time duties as priest and canon. I would give advice if needed, but from now on, the upkeep and the running of the schools was Monsieur Adrian Niel's responsibility. Come in. Come in. Father LaSalle, everything has come together beautifully. I'm pleased to report that our school is already full. That's wonderful, Adrian. Congratulations. Thank you, Father. Father, I, I would like to start another school in Saint-Jacques. Uh, uh, Monsieur Niel, that's not a good idea. You must proceed slowly and cautiously. You will upset the city officials. Father, a wealthy widow is interested in endowing the school. I've already seen her. And when I told her you were my promoter and protector, I immediately won her confidence. Promoter and protector? Uh, this school opened in September of the same year. Now there were two schools, one on each side of the town. Come in. Father LaSalle, I'm delighted to report that we've opened another school in the parish of saint Samforien. I had to hire two more teachers, and our place in Saint Maurice is simply not adequate to provide for our growing numbers. Something has to be done soon. Now there were three. This school was also an instant success. However, as time progressed, it soon became apparent that although Neal could open schools, he was not the best at staffing them. The men he hired were for the most part illiterate, without education, or social graces. <laughs> Their table manners were deplorable. Among the poor, eating with your hands was considered acceptable behavior, and heaven only knows when they washed them last. They dipped their bread into a common sauce boat of grease drippings, <laughs> ate what they wanted, and threw the rest under the table. When they came to apply for the post of schoolmaster, they were usually dressed in their grease-covered clothes. Some were even hired out of pubs, unemployed and desperate for work. The result was the children learned nothing, the parents became resentful, and the teachers themselves utterly discouraged. It was obvious something had to be done. The idea of me having to take up this work was appalling. Well, no one expected a man of my wealth and rank to descend to the level of a schoolmaster take charge of them, to train them for the work, to go with them to the schools and breathe the fetid atmosphere of the overcrowded classrooms was hard to contemplate. This situation had all the horror of a nightmare. I needed guidance. I was told there was a priest in Paris, a Father Beret, who might be able to help me. Monsieur Niel and the Sisters of the Child Jesus speak very highly of him. They tell me he has already opened up a number of schools for the poor, schools for boys, as well as schools for girls. Father Beret, it is a great honor to...
It is a great honor to meet you. They say you also possess a gift of discernment for the spiritual direction of souls. Of all men, Father Beret, I believe you are the one best qualified to give me direction and advice regarding the will of God in these matters. Take the schoolmasters into your house and live with them. Into my home? Uh, I, I, I have three younger brothers still living with me. To make them live a common life with these men is simply unreasonable. You ask for my advice, I have given it to you. Take the schoolmasters into your house and live with them. Christ said we must forsake home and family if we are to follow him. I resolve to do so, come what may. I decided to rent another house here in Reims, on Rue Neuf, and invite the schoolmasters, my new brothers, to come and live with me there. For better or worse, our future was now in the hands of God. Upon hiring, I had given each man a new schoolmaster outfit and a clean, warm place to sleep. I also insisted that every evening we gather around the dinner table for conversation and instruction. Who takes care of us if the schools fail? God and his providence will take care of us. Open your eyes and see the birds that fly through the air. Not a single one of them lacks what is needed. We aren't birds, Father. <laughs> we need more than worms to eat and, and a nest to sleep in. If schools could fail at any time. Then what do we do? What happens when we get old? If his generous and kindly concern extends even to the smallest of animals, how do you believe that he, to whom you consecrate your labor, will abandon you in old age and leave you in misery in a life spent in his service? Easy to trust in God when you have a rich cannonry. And a big fat inheritance. We have nothing. We, we have, have nothing. 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 It is true. I do have everything. And they have nothing. I must live as they live if I wish my words to prove effective. An endowment for the schools. I could set up a trust and donate all my wealth to the schools, leaving me as poor as they are. This will allow me to give them lessons about the blessings of poverty. And I could still remain a priest and canon, as well as superior of this new community. Renounce your canonry. Divine providence must be the only foundation on which the Christian schools are established. The schools themselves will remain stable, so long as they have nothing else on which to rely. Renounce my canonry? For God's sake, I will go see the Archbishop and tell him of my decision. I have reviewed your letter of resignation from the canon chapter of the Metropolitan Cathedral of Rheims. I want you to know that I do not agree with Father Beret on this matter. Quite frankly, I cannot afford to lose you. What can I do to convince you to stay? You are dangerously stubborn. All right, then resign. But I refuse you my blessing. It was done. I could now dedicate all my efforts towards the schools. Ooh.